Hi everyone, my name is Sai Venom and I'm with the IBM Cloud team. Today we want to talk about Kubernetes and OpenShift. Now it's not exactly fair for me to compare those two directly because Kubernetes is an open source project, whereas OpenShift on the other hand is an offering by Red Hat. But underneath the covers, OpenShift is actually powered by something called OKD, or Origin Kubernetes Distribution. And this includes Kubernetes as well as a number of other open source projects. So we've got Kubernetes, maybe your favorite container runtime, something like Docker. And if you want to take advantage of service meshing capabilities, they have integrations with Istio and a number of other open source projects that we'll talk about. But let's talk about a few different ways that kind of highlights the differences between working with your apps, whether they're running you know, strictly Kubernetes or if you're using OpenShift. To start, we'll talk about deploying an application. So deploying an application in Kubernetes can actually be a little bit time consuming. So first, let's assume that you have your code up on um, something like GitHub. So you'll pull that code to your local machine, maybe spin up a container. Once you've got that container, you'll have to figure out where you want to actually host it, so the registry. So maybe you want to use something like Docker Hub, or if you want a private registry, you'll have to figure that out. One thing I want to mention, if you take advantage of managed Kubernetes, so something from uh, like Kubernetes from your favorite cloud provider, generally they have options to have a registry or a private registry directly in that experience. Next, you know, once it's on that registry, you'll actually have to figure out your CI CD story. And this is where things get complicated because there's so many different options for deploying your applications. On the OpenShift side of things, on the other hand, they have an opinionated approach. So all you really have to do is create an application and a project, at which point OpenShift does the heavy lifting on the back end. So it's going to create those pipelines. It's going to create all of that automation that you need to do things like dev, test, and prod for your applications. So really, it makes it a lot easier. And you can get started um, maybe using something like their Jenkins approach or source to image capabilities. But one thing I do want to mention here, you have a lot more flexibility on the Kubernetes side of things. As you know, you don't have an opinionated prescribed way of doing this. So for power users and teams that are you know, kind of um, influenced by legacy architectures, Kubernetes might be more effective. For teams that really just want to be told how to get everything done and have a streamlined approach for their DevOps and pipeline approach, the, open, uh, the OpenShift side of things makes things quite easy. Next, let's talk about managing your applications. So the two sides of the puzzle here, first let's start with how managing your apps looks like in Kubernetes. So you can take advantage of the default dashboards that comes with any Kubernetes distribution, but unfortunately for most operations teams, that's not quite enough. So they'll have to take it a step further and install additional dashboards. So maybe they'll use something like an Elk stack. Maybe they want to use Grafana instead. Maybe Istio. The options are kind of endless. So essentially, you know, it's a lot of digging around to figure out the exact solution that fits their use case. On the OpenShift side of things, again, there's an opinionated and prescribed way of doing this. In addition, they have an awesome web console that builds on the Kubernetes APIs. And, makes it, and comes with a lot of different capabilities for SREs and operations teams to really manage their workloads. In addition, there's prescribed and kind of opinionated ways to do those dashboards that we talked about. So they suggest an EFK stack um, and have different ways to integrate capabilities like Istio if you wanted to use it. So again, by taking advantage of some of their automated installers and Ansible playbooks, managing applications is a little bit easier with the kind of caveat that you give up some of that flexibility as they do have prescribed approaches. Next, let's talk about node configuration or you know day-to-day -day operations. So a cluster is going to be made up of a number of VMs, whether they're you know virtualized or bare metal, whatever it might be, the cluster is going to have some VMs within it. The Kubernetes way of adding additional kind of VMs into that cluster can be kind of time consuming. So setting up self-registration or kind of the different cloud automation of setting up or creating new VMs and bringing them into the cluster, this is time consuming and requires scripts to be developed. On the OpenShift side of things, 
it's a little bit easier. They have Ansible playbooks and installers to bring in new VMs into your cluster. So it's a fairly straightforward process. And they even have ways to do or, and handle auto-scaling or spinning up you know, new VMs in response to load. The last thing I want to highlight is security. So OpenShift and Red Hat kind of tries to fill the gaps where the open source community maybe hasn't done so. So by working with real enterprise customers, they've realized that by kind of creating best security practices from scratch, they, they're really able to tackle some of the problems that some of the customers need to be able to use Kubernetes. So let's talk about a few different things here. So in the Kubernetes side of things, you know, chances are you're not working on a project by yourself. There's a team of people, each of which have, have different permissions. So in the beginning, Kubernetes didn't even have something like RBAC, which uh, OpenShift kind of saw. But you know, now we can take it for granted that they have RBAC. Um, they're going to have some other capabilities to do things like you know, IAM. But you know, at the end of the day, this is, these are all things that you have to build out and are time consuming. On the OpenShift side of things, these kind of all come out of the box. So when you create that project, you get access to all of these. You really just have to add the users. And it'll handle things like Kubernetes namespacing and creating different kind of security policies with the best practices. And you kind of get all of that from scratch. However, there's a small trade-off. So for example, in Kubernetes, you can pretty much take any image out there in Docker Hub and expect that it'll run as, you know, as expected. But on the OpenShift side of things, there's kind of restricted permissions. The containers don't run as root. So sometimes images don't run as expected. So that's kind of a small caveat for having those best practices of security kind of instilled from the get-go. Um, so it's something that you kind of have to balance. At the end of the day, OpenShift is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's very important to understand the fundamentals of Kubernetes that power OpenShift. For individuals and small IT teams, OpenShift really streamlines a lot of those very difficult tasks. If you want to learn more, check out the description for more links. If you have any questions, be sure to drop a comment. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more videos in the future. Thank you.